All right. Well, we're into the home stretch here. We're going to um, finish up magnetic resonance with a lecture about uh, applications. Uh, continue on from uh, Tuesday. And just as some review, recall we have a magnet. Gradient coils inside the magnet, an RF transmitter, are inside here, inside this tube. This is usually about 80 centimeters to a meter across. And then we have receiver coils picking up signal from the patient. In particular, uh, these receiver coils are isolated around the heart uh, for our applications. So one of the issues with MR, uh, and a practical issue, is you have to lie down in this magnet uh, you have to lie still and be fairly comfortable sitting sort of strapped down in a, in a uh, cylindrical tube. And so for some people that's, that's a non-starter, they can't do it, other people just fall asleep. Um, but as we'll see, uh, you, you have to get the patient on your side and they have to suspend their respiration for sometimes up to 15 seconds so that you put, keep the heart in the same position at least with respect to respiratory motion. And um, what isn't shown on, on this, uh, in this photograph, is usually this patient would have three ECG leads on her chest here and a, and a cable coming out to uh, feed an ECG into the scanner for triggering. So this is a very idealized picture, as you might imagine. <clears throat> so just to review our two major uh, relaxation times, or parameters that govern the contrast in MR uh, are T1 and T2. And T1 relaxation is the uh, time constant for the recovery of the longitudinal magnetization after we have uh, applied an RF pulse to make that longitudinal magnetization zero. And so it climbs back to its steady state MZ value uh, M0 with this mono-exponential uh, curve, uh, T1. And T2, as a review, when we tip the magnetization into the transverse plane, uh, the different magnetization vectors <coughs> precess at slightly different frequencies, and they, uh, when, they're, when they add up to give you your full signal, uh, that signal decreases over time, and that's a mono-exponential decay uh, from M0, if this is a 90 degree pulse, down to zero with a, a simple decay constant T2. So those two processes are the things that create different brightness, for the most part, uh, in magnetic resonance uh, images. There has been a trend in the last uh, five years or so uh, to actually produce images which are parametric maps of those time constants as opposed to an image that is proportional, the brightness is proportional to T1 or the brightness is proportional to T2, uh, why not produce a map for which the pixel value is equal to T1 or T2? And one of the reasons this is, is difficult is because you have to acquire enough data to fit uh, your model uh, for decay or, or signal recovery such that you can come up with an estimate of that parameter. So here's some very, uh, these are stellar examples of those parameter fits. And so this is a pure T1 image. You can see the, T, the T1 in the blood is longer than the T1 in the normal myocardium. And uh, the T1 in the septum here obviously is elevated with respect to the normal myocardium. And so there's a process going on here that makes the native T1 of that tissue longer, and therefore you can, you can measure it on a T1 map. Similarly, whatever's going on in this septum is affecting the T2 such that the signal decay is slower, the signal is lasting longer, and the T2 value is higher. T2 star is the T2 we measure when we don't use a spin echo, when we let all of the uh, mechanisms that decrease signal coherence occur, uh, T2 star is always shorter than T2. Uh, and you can then 
also uh, measure things like the fat fraction in tissue. And so in normal myocardium, there's very little fat except in this lesion here. You, you have, for some reason, infiltration of fat. And that can be measured uh, by chemical shift um, because the fat resonates at slightly different frequency than the water. Uh, early gadolinium enhancement images. So these are T1 weighted images. They're not T1 images, but they're proportional to T1. And you can see here there's a very dark rim in which the gadolinium did not get into the, the heart. And this is late gadolinium enhancement, which we've uh, seen before. And this looks like the same uh, heart as this one, uh, showing that there's some uptake and retention of the contrast agent here. We can also look at quantitative perfusion by measuring multiple images over time uh, during the injection of a contrast agent and then looking at the signal and, and actually estimating the myocardial perfusion. And the units of myocardial perfusion would be milliliters per gram per minute of blood flow. So quickly as a, as a review again, if we apply a 180 degree pulse to put the magnetization vector in the negative uh, direction, uh, we'll have different recovery curves depending on T1 uh, for different tissues. So cerebral spinal fluid, which is like water, has long T1, it'll take a long time to recover. Normal brain tissue and fat has a short T1. And so if we make our image here, right, if we apply a 180 degree pulse and then make all our imaging acquisitions around this point, the cerebral spinal fluid will show up as zero signal here at this crossing. Brain will be mid-gray and fat will be quite bright. Okay. So in the heart, uh, a number of things change the T1 of myocardium. And um, one of those things, as, as we know, is the injection of a contrast agent. The T1 gets shorter. And so you get a brighter uh, signal. But myocardial infarction, that is the downstream effect of cutting blood flow off to the heart, uh, causes an elevated T1 uh, because of edema in the area. So you get swelling when you have tissue, tissue damage, right? And so here's some interesting uh, this is a native T1 map showing uh, T1 of blood is up here in the red, you know, about 1,500 milliseconds. T1 of the normal myocardium here is, is just below 1,000. It's green. And this is actually when you do this type of measurement, you have to be very precise about it because the, the T1 values in normal myocardium are quite reproducible from one person to the next. Right, so it's a, it's a highly characteristic um, uh, measurement of the tissues, this T1 value. Uh, here's a patient who's suffering from acute myocarditis, which is like an infection of the, of the heart muscle. And so there'll be swelling and edema in that region that is affected in the myocardium. And so the T1 value jumps up. Uh, uh, cardiac uh, amyloidosis is a sort of a fibrotic infiltration throughout the myocardium, and that increases the T1 globally. And so you see, even though there isn't really a huge regional difference in T1, the whole T1 value in the whole heart is, is elevated. And so that's um, essentially the, the early promise of MR was that we could actually identify specific tissue types like a malignant uh, cancerous growth from a benign one using these T1 values. That was the original hypothesis way back in the 70s. Right? And so now we're finally getting to the stage where uh, the ability to measure T1 is getting precise enough that some of this promise can be realized. Just to review what we're interested in, if we have a, an acute coronary occlusion here and there's uh, a downstream part of the myocardium that is at risk for dying because of lack of blood, uh, we have a set of different types of tissue that we can 
encounter when we image this. Uh, we have basically an ischemic region. This dark region means there is low blood flow. So if in the pink region, in the normal part, say at stress, we have three mils per gram per minute of blood flow, in the ischemic region we might have one or 0.5 mils per gram per minute. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that this tissue is dead, it just has low flow. That's ischemia. And then after the ischemia is done, say we open this vessel, right? And so we restore flow. And this happens a lot when people show up at the ER and they have crushing chest pain, they open the vessel with a, a stent and you, and you reperfuse that area of myocardium. And so around the central core of the challenged area, the heart might come back to normal quite quickly. And then we have this central part, which is viable, but it still has post-ischemic dysfunction. That is, the cells are still trying to recover. They might be edematous. Uh, they might be shooting off different electrical uh, abnormalities, etc. And then two to four hours afterwards, we can see sort of long, longer-term damage to this tissue. It's still viable, but this stuff here has died, and it's necrotic. And you know, when we image someone at this phase, we will see this as a dark spot uh, during the perfusion and the late gadolinium enhancement. This stuff here will be high T2 values, high T1 values. It'll retain gadolinium, and then the normal stuff will wash it out. And then if you have a permanent occlusion and it's necrotic, then you know this on late enhancement gadolinium will just show up right. So those are the types of tissue that we're interested in, in measuring in people who've suffered uh, a heart attack. And the question now, how do you measure T1 really accurately in an MRI scanner? Uh, so here's a, uh, an image in which the brightness of a pixel is the T1 value. Right? So it's a map of the T1 value. So obviously out in the air, in the lung, we have no, a noise field, right? Because we don't really have any data out there. But we get a consistent T1 value for blood and fairly consistent for myocardium. So how do we make that measurement? Well, we know that the signal uh, will recover with this curve. And if we can get data points along this curve, we can just fit that exponential, right? Just fit the optimal T1 value to put you know, those points on a curve uh, using a least squares fit. And so if we make images, Say we, we apply a 180 degree pulse, so we make negative M naught here. We invert the magnetization, and we make an image right away after doing that. We'll get an image that looks like this, and the magnitude of the images looks like this, uh, because we have a fairly high signal, because it, it isn't crossing zero. As we delay our image acquisition from the time of the original inversion pulse, uh, we see that blood now is crossing zero here. And so the blood is nulled, the myocardium is not nulled, it's the blue tissue, say, uh, which is bright. And then we make another image out here, both blood and myocardium are bright now because they're up here. And so just the time evolution of those signals inside each voxel gets plotted, and then you fit using a least squares technique. <laughs> Uh, a mono-exponential curve to that, fit the best T1, and then show that as your image. So what's the problem with that? Well, it's nice that you have a, a T1 value, so it's not a, it's not a mixture of different uh, components. It's just the T1. However, this took a long time to do. Right? We had to have an image at each one of these points in order to fit those voxels over time. So we made you know, these five images to do that. And then these images take a really long time because you do a 180 degree pulse and then you wait a considerable time, you know, many seconds, in order to acquire the data. And so there's long delays in there. So to get all of these images, you're going to have to do each one of those images on a separate breath hold, more than likely. Um, 
And just to acquire that whole series is going to take you many minutes, sort of 10 minutes, something like that, if you do it like this. There are new, faster methods uh, for doing this. They produce T1 maps that are um, accurate, but obviously they have so this is the optimal way to do it because you're using the maximum dynamic range of your signal recovery. We can actually use a technique called saturation recovery uh, to measure T1 with a smaller dynamic range, but probably enough data to get a reasonable T1 fit. And this is how it goes. So we take an image without any kind of pre-saturation pulse. So no inversion pulse, no saturation pulse. And that's our baseline image. Okay. And that has a value up here. It's the brightest image we're going to see. Then the next image we take on, say, the next heartbeat, we apply a 90 degree pulse and zero out the longitudinal magnetization. And we make a picture at some delay after that uh, application of that saturation pulse. If we crush, if all of the transverse magnetization is decayed away by this time and we make another RF pulse frank, and we make a, a picture with this magnetization, it's a very dim picture because we haven't waited very long for that magnetization to recover. We, we then let it recover after making this picture and then we apply another saturation pulse, start at zero again, wait a little bit longer, and make another picture. Let it recover, saturation pulse, wait a little bit longer. So each one of these delays is slightly different, slightly longer. Make another image, another image, another image, another image. And so we do this across this many heartbeats. So a patient can hold their breath for that many heartbeats, you know dozen, fifteen, something like that, heartbeats. The issue is we need to make our image very quickly, right? We need to do it either in a single shot here, so some kind of rapid readout to get all of the information here, or you need to repeat this whole thing and put data together in case space. Um, most of the time it's just a rapid acquisition is used to take this, and so then we look at, say, for a given voxel in the heart, we look at its amplitude in each one of these pictures, and we get a curve that looks like this. We know the equation that this curve should recover with under our model on our given T1 and just fit for T1 and make a T1 map. That's called saturation recovery. Another way of doing this is a similar thing except we invert the magnetization so we start with magnetization at negative m naught which gives us a larger dynamic range uh, and so we invert the magnetization make an image here which is right after that inversion and so the amplitude will will be this point uh, we make an image here at some delay after that, so we read out some of the magnetization vector, but we don't use it all. We, we read out the next amount here, and that gives us a point right here on the curve. And then we read out a point here, and that gives us a point over here. Right. And we do that three times, essentially. We, we now allow the whole thing to recover, go back to m naught, do another 180 degree pulse, read out another short delay image, and that will be that second point on this curve here. Okay. And this one will be a slightly longer delay than this guy, and so that'll be this second point here, right? And again, this one will be this point up here. So now we have one, two, three, four, five, six points along that curve. We then do it again but with five pulses, and we fill in this point, that point, that point, and then two extra ones here for the baseline. So now we have the, you know, that set of points there. We've got five, eight, eleven points to fit a T1 curve. 
that occurred over, you know, uh, so that's two, four, six, eight, about 16 heartbeats, right? Uh, this is kind of what the field is, is settling in on as a way to measure T1 accurately in the heart and, um, and versions of this. The people have modified this slightly. But when you sort uh, the images in terms of uh, sorted by inversion time or delay time, so this order of pictures is not this order of you know, acquisitions is sorted to delay time, and you can see that there's this nice recovery along there for fitting the T1. So that's how you do you know, measure the parameter T1 uh, in cardiac imaging. And <clears throat> so here's a review of those two things. We started with saturation recovery. We acquire the saturation-free apply a 90 degree pulse, not a 180, a 90 degree pulse, and then wait some time after that pulse to make a picture, and then we repeat that for different delays after the saturation pulse. Um, <clears throat> so, and then in the molly or the inversion, it's sort of the same thing, it's a slightly more complicated uh, sorting of those uh, times, the delay times, uh, but we have a higher dynamic range uh, for that. So there's a couple of challenges obviously, breath hold duration, um, the pixel, when, when you've got now a set of like whether it's 11 images or 12 images or something and you're saying I'm going to measure the same pixel coordinate in each one of those 12 images and fit a T1 curve. Well, the assumption there is that the same piece of tissue is inside that voxel. And that's a poor assumption if the patient is not holding their breath really well. Right. Um, and so that, that is probably one of the uh, big problems with, with the method because if you let somebody just free breathe and you acquire MR images, right? So this is acquired over, um, the whole duration of this acquisition is 45 heartbeats, but there's 25 images in here. And the patient here is just breathing freely because this, this is a perfusion acquisition where you inject contrast, it goes in the right ventricle, goes to the lungs and comes back to the left ventricle. And you can see a remarkable amount of motion, right? So this is the breathing that's occurring, say, when you're doing a six-minute PET acquisition in the heart or, a, you know, a six-minute SPECT acquisition in the heart, right? That's the kind of motion you're talking about. And that's why those images are so dang blurry, right? It's just they, the heart's moving around a lot. Each one of these images, you know, only takes uh, 100 and 40 milliseconds or something, right? Um, well, so I've cheated here because these are CT images. Right? So each one is really fast. So you can see a very clear picture, but you can also see like just how much breathing motion occurs just when a, a patient is asked to breathe quietly. Right? So in MR, same thing occurs. So here's say three different time delays after inversion pulses at different heartbeats. And if we contour the myocardium here, I mean, I'm sorry this is so dim, but there's the contour at this time. And you compare that contour with say one over here, you can see there's obviously a great deal of motion here as there is here. And so you have to fix that problem, right, if you're gonna do this. And one way of fixing it is just make people hold their breath, right? And you know, so you have to get all of your acquisition inside that window, and that's usually 10 to, if they're really willing to hold their breath, you can go 20 seconds. 15 is you know, pretty good, 75% of the people can do that. 10 seconds, most people can do that, all right? So MR function, like if you get someone to hold their breath, which this person is doing, because you can see their, di their diaphragm is not really drifting one way or the other, 
it's, it's in a fixed position. And all of these surfaces are pretty well in a fixed position. This is their liver, their stomach, interstitial fat, right? Uh, these are vessels in the lungs. So you get these tremendous pictures if someone can hold their breath, right? And this, this would be acquired over about eight heartbeats, something like that. The other great thing about this is, is that you see very accurate estimates of whether or not the muscle itself is thickening and producing you know, normal ejection. And so the function is measured really well, just visually. You can look at this person and say, that is normal. Right? Or even hyper, a little hypernormal. Their ejection fraction looks a little bit high. They might be stressed. Right? Which happens. People go into scanners. They don't like small spaces. Their adrenaline goes up. And they wind up getting a stress test. Because their heart's like beating away at 100 beats per minute or something. Some other really cool things to notice here. Uh, up in this groove... This is the anterior groove between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. And remember from our diagrams what vessel runs down that anterior groove. That's the left anterior descending coronary artery. Right? And you can see it quite clearly here, right? There's a, you know, a, a rim, a dark rim, and then a bright center. It is surrounded by this bright signal, which is fat. And the blood and the tissue wall are basically water. And so they're, they're resonating at slightly different frequencies, which causes a cancellation of the signal in, those, in the volumes of the voxels that have a combination of water and fat. And so everywhere around the vessel, like around the rim, you get this cancellation of signal. So it's a really cool contrast mechanism. Um, and then circumferent or the descending posterior descending coronary artery is back here uh, I don't know which one this is in a different view this is a long axis view and so now uh, the patient again is holding their breath very well you don't see any kind of drift over time and no ghosting artifacts in the phase encoding direction uh, if if the heart moves over over the time of the acquisition uh, you, you can see quite nicely the evolution of the mitral valve here, of the leaflets of the mitral valve, uh, and the tricuspid valve actually over here. The interesting thing about this, so you can also see a swirling of dark signal here, and this is signal that is sort of dynamically changing its its amplitude because of the fact that it's blood moving into the imaging slice. Right? So it's outside the imaging slice and then it comes in. It hasn't really seen excitation pulses up to this point and then it, it starts seeing excitation pulses in it and we can watch it dynamically get reduced, its signal reduced. But the, the really cool thing, and they, this is a subtle point, is that this image is more than likely taken over, say, 16 heartbeats, 8 to 16 heartbeats, something like that. And they, the raw data is collected over those 8 to 16 heartbeats put together and this movie is made. So all of this stuff has to absolutely reproduce itself over each of those beats in order for this image to look any good. It's like a super sensitive test as to whether or not the heart is doing the same thing on each beat. If it isn't, you get these horrendous artifacts in MR. Basically, signal starts getting uh, mislabeled and, and putting in the wrong location in the phase encoding direction. And you get all these ghosts and everything. We don't see that here. Therefore, one has to assume this is happening every heartbeat exactly the same way. Not, even, not just the valves, but also this flow signal here, right? which is really cool. So that kind of jet and reproducible circulatory motion of the fluid is happening on each beat in the same way. Okay. Again, here's a, a large coronary vessel. That looks like it's a cardiac vein, that thing, because it's, it's so big. Right? And then the coronary vessel would be that smaller signal there. This would be the right coronary artery over here. Uh, and so 
there is hope, right, that you can measure coronary arteriograms and, and high-resolution pictures with MR of coronaries. The problem is the slice thickness in this image is probably about seven millimeters. And so when you go down to the vessel and, and look at it in detail, it's really hard to detect small features that you need to, to identify a stenosis. Major stenosis should probably be able to detect it. And uh, in another view, again, with MR, you have this fantastic ability to measure an arbitrary plane. Uh, you can just select any plane you want ahead of time. Um, unlike CT, where you acquire the whole volume and then you cut the planes up afterwards, in MR, most of the time to get dynamic data like this, you need to identify which plane you're going to look at and prescribe that on the scanner and then take the acquisition and then look at that single plane. That's definitely what was done here. And you can see, look at this dark <coughs> swirling blood coming in into this location here. That's really cool. And I don't think anybody has used this kind of natural contrast and swirling to measure flow or anything. I don't think that's a technique uh, there's the cardiac vein again. It's really large uh, here, and this is, a an, again, a really nice view of the mitral uh, valve leaflets showing that they're prolapsing, uh, or they're, that they are not prolapsing, that they're uh, coapting very nicely. Okay. Uh, any question on, on that? The other, the other interesting thing about cardiac motion is you can see that it is broadcast to other organs in the in the body, right? So it's it's like when the, the heart contracts, it sends a uh, vibration like a long shock wave down through the body, which you can you know measure like displacement with this as your stimulus. Right? So if you wanted to measure whether something's stiff or something I like got in the body, you could use this as the stimulus for for pushing on stuff inside the, the cavity. I don't know that anyone's done that either, actually. So that would be a cool project. So with MR slices, we have this, it's usually about five to seven millimeters thick slice. And the in-plane resolution on these is usually about one and a half millimeters by one and a half millimeters. That's the voxel size. And in MR, that's a reasonable way to state resolution, okay, is the, the voxel size, because usually you, you match your voxel size to the resolution pretty well. End diastole, the blood chamber is full, is as full as it's going to be. And then at end systole, the blood chamber is as empty as it's going to be. And you can calculate quite simply the ejection fraction, the amount of blood that's ejected. Uh, also, you can look at the dimension of the muscle here at end diastole and look at it at end systole and get radial thickening from this, this uh, signal. This is a normal 22-year-old grad student, right? So it's a really healthy, healthy heart. You can see it's perfectly symmetric and, and the thickening is really nice and everything like that. The other thing we can do with MR that we can't do with echo or CT for that matter, is we can apply markers to the tissue using the MR methodology itself. So this is the same person imaged twice. This is imaged without a technique called myocardial tags, and this is with the tags applied. These are two separate MR acquisitions. These tags were not put on here by image processing tricks. That is the object now that we're imaging. And that object has normal signal here, but there are parallel planes running through the whole volume. And in those parallel planes, no MR signal will emerge. Right? And the reason for that is just prior to making this picture, we applied effectively a 90 degree saturation pulse inside each one of those planes immediately before making this picture. And so if you do a 90 degree saturation pulse, the magnetization comes down, it's now zero. 
you crush out the transverse magnetization and now make a picture and that will come up as zero but if you do that selectively then you get this selective pattern of, of tags these tags basically recover back to normal magnetization, to the level of the normal magnetization or the magnetization that was not affected by those pre-saturation pulses. The signal comes back to that baseline level with T1 recovery, right? And so they fade, this, this stripe here will fade over time and it fades like T1 recovery. But luckily in the, in the myocardium, T1's, you know, what did we see it was? in our a few slides ago it was just under a thousand right so it's pretty long right? so these will last a while they'll last a second two seconds and from end diastole to end systole that's only about 350 milliseconds in a normal person right and so you still have really good contrast between the pre-saturated tissue and the tissue that did not see the pre-saturation so this gives you a set of fiducial markers now, which is like an image processing, you know, scientist playground, right? You've got all of these things you can now detect and measure the underlying displacement field based on what you find in these pictures, right? So in some sense, this, this picture is probably 50 milliseconds after the application of the tags. And you can see there is already some displacement in the heart. So we're a little bit late into the game. The heart's already started to contract here. And, and why do I say that? Well, look, if you look at the angle, see these, these tags are sort of tilted down. They're not just sitting there in a, on just parallel lines. So this piece of tissue and this, the, the whole thing looks like it's rotated slightly here. But this is the earliest image we could achieve after the the QRS. So everything is triggered by the patient's EKG. You put the tags down at the QRS and then you take your first picture as soon as possible. And that shows that it's a little bit late. I mean, it's, you know, the heart has started to contract. And then here it is at end systole. We, we kind of know ahead of time. It's not like we kind of know. We know because we programmed where to put these tags where those tags are at time zero, theoretically. So in some sense, we don't even need to detect them at end diastole because we know where we put them, right? From, we just program the scanner to put them there. And then we can measure where they went here. And then you have a displacement of the tag plane. So this is a sample of that tag plane, 350 milliseconds after it was placed as a flat plane and now it's been deformed into this shape. So we can fit that deformation and then take all of our fits from all of these deformations and come up with a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional displacement you know, for, for the heart at this time. Any, any questions about that? Yep. That's exactly right. It's relying on the patient's EKG being very consistent. So if, if their EKG is, is highly non-consistent, then the heart, not only uh, will, will you have funny relaxation things happening with the magnetization, and so the, the very, you know, it'll vary its height, but the actual volume of blood contained in the heart beat to beat will change. Because if, if you have a long R to R, you have more time for the ventricle to expand and fill. And so you, you get a full ventricle after a long R to R. And then if you have a quick beat, you have a non-filled ventricle. And so the actual geometry of the ventricle is different, you know, for different R to R values. So really you need a sequence of heartbeats that are the same R to R in order to assume that at least the pose of the heart is the same for each one. In, 
it can withstand, we can withstand a certain amount of variability at the end, you know, 10% or so. Uh, and because when you trigger from the EKG and you, and you measure dynamics to end systole, that time is fairly consistent. Even if, even if my R to R changes by 10%, the time for the heart to contract is usually about the same with that small change in the R to R. So those images remain coherent, the ones that are gated or, te or to the QRS. Okay. Now there's, a, there's an issue here, right? I can't, I can't do a full 3D displacement field based on just this picture, right? Because I don't really have enough information for left to right displacement. Or for that matter, for through plane displacement. I mean, this tissue here is not the tissue that was sitting in this spatial slice at end diastole. It had moved into this slice. So it's a full 3D motion field, right? So this really only gives me up-down motion, right? So if I have a point on a tag here, the only information I can definitively derive from finding out where that point is is its displacement from time zero to that point in that direction, just one direction. So it's a whole set of displacements in Y, basically, is what you have here. And then to, uh, but you can, and you get a set at each time frame after, you know, the QRS. So you can make a movie where you see these, you know, uh, planes displacing in time. Now I'm sorry about the breakup here. There's something in the encoding made these columns, but. Uh, you know, so it's a it's a fairly nice dynamic way of measuring uh, displacement. You can see the tags don't really displace in the chest wall; they're fixed. However, in the liver, these tags get pulled up towards the heart, you know, over time. And you can do this experiment in skeletal muscle too. You can like, you know, flex and see it go. So if you put a grid on the heart, then we could at least do two dimensional displacement in this field, right? So, and the other interesting thing about a grid is you can just directly visualize the 2D strain at every point in the myocardium, right? So, if I pick any box, like say I pick this box right here and track it, I see it starts as a square and then it becomes this diamond with the lengthening in the radial direction. Right? And so that deformation, I can measure radial thickening just directly from that little box. That little box, you know, is like a four millimeter by four millimeter box. So it's a tiny volume of myocardium. Uh, so this is basically now considered the gold standard for how you measure myocardial strain with non-invasive imaging. Right? The gold standard with invasive imaging is you put gold beads in the myocardium and you image the displacement of those gold beads under biplane high rate x-ray. Get 100 frames a second or something with these with an for a fluoroscopy system, fluoroscopy system. And if you're looking from two views, you can solve for the 3D trajectory of those beads. And so that's usually considered the highest resolution, both temporally and spatially, method for measuring strain. However, I would argue that when you implant a set of gold beads in the myocardium, that's a significant perturbation to the myocardium. I would assume that we would see edema and all sorts of things. And so uh, this is completely, you know, non-destructive, non-invasive. So a lot of work has been done. This is called myocardial tagging, and a lot of work has been done to measure myocardial function with it. Um, so a way of looking at it is I can acquire images with vertical tags to measure horizontal displacement, horizontal tags to measure vertical displacement, and then in the orthogonal direction to measure the displacement through the imaging slice, where this, these two images are in the same slice. This one shows how things move up and down through that slice. And so with those three sets of tags, you can then find these displacement planes and solve completely for the three-dimensional 
uh, displacement field in the heart, and then overlay on top of your heart what the strain values are. Right? And so here is that the onset of contraction, uh, the, the color bar here represents the amount of thickening in the radial direction. So that's towards the center. If we cause the center of mass of this is here, this is thickening of these boxes towards the center. 40 milliseconds later, you can see that the thickening here is quite high just in this region. And so this small part of the myocardium has been activated electrically and it's starting to contract. The rest of it has not, right? And so it in fact compresses this tissue right here. So you're, you're seeing transmural activation of muscle in the, in the myocardium, right? So you get a lengthening here as it contracts, shortens in this direction, and then it compresses here. So you get these extraordinarily detailed mechanical strain maps of, of the myocardium. These can be used to differentiate between, say, patients who have normal mechanical contraction and those who are headed down uh, the heart failure route, and so their muscle is, is contracting abnormally. Uh, if you plot the circumferential strain or the circumferential shortening, so if I look at each box and measure how does it get shorter in this direction, right, in that loop direction, and this shows over time during systole, it gets, say, 15 or 18 percent shorter, you know, over time to end systole. Then it opens up when it's when we're refilling the ventricle. This is diastasis, and then atrial kick opens the the heart more, right? In someone who's headed down the pathway of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, their muscle is abnormal. They contract, but it's stunted. And then when that heart relaxes, it takes a very long time. It's very viscous, like the heart just sort of opens up quite slowly. And that is a telltale sign of heart failure, right, is this slope changes. So in this region C, you know, between uh, the valve, basically the mitral valve opening and coming up here, uh, that slope is the, is the distinctive feature that shows heart failure. You can make very accurate three-dimensional maps of myocardial strain under different conditions. And so this is time along this axis. Uh, the, the dot represents the septum, and we see the evolution of shortening, which as it goes, as the tissue gets circumferentially more short, it, the color scale goes blue. This, uh, let's do this one's simplest. This is right ventricular apex pacing. We have a pacing lead on the ventricle right here. And so we pace the heart from that location and do this experiment, the same tagging experiment. And you can see the contraction move out from the, the pacing site. So where you pace the heart, it contracts early there. And in fact, because it's contracting on this side, this side hasn't been electrically activated and it gets distended. So you get this desynchronous contraction and you can measure it very accurately with MR tagging. Okay, let's, any questions on mechanical? And you can imagine that if you did a stress test and you look at mechanics, and the mechanics starts failing in a person under stress, that is a, a tremendous indicator of ischemic disease, of significant ischemic disease, that, that which causes a, a symptom or a sign. So let's go back and talk just briefly about perfusion. As you recall, we do a bolus injection. Uh, we start taking MR images all through this process. And uh, we see the right ventricular enhancement first, left ventricular enhancement next. That's the, the signal curve of the LV. And then myocardial enhancement looks like this. Right? So the tissue starts at a certain MR signal value and then it goes up to a to a brighter signal because the T1 gets shorter as the contrast goes in. Again, this is CT data, sorry, but showing the problem associated with this type of perfusion scan is mostly patient breathing because it's going to occur over about 30 heartbeats, right? 30 to 40 heartbeats, they can't hold their breath. So what you can do is 
this is where image processing gurus come in handy. You take those pictures and you basically align them one to each other. Okay. You can try doing it with an affine transformation, which is just a simple translation rotation, simple thing. And that usually does not work. You usually have to make some kind of spatial deformation in order to, to place those pictures one on top of the other, like over the time frames. But if we look at this in the axial plane, you can see that that uh, basically calibration of those pictures and deformation of each picture such that they lie on top of each other is working very well so that we can put a region of interest around the septum here and get a perfusion value over those 30 heartbeats. Okay. You can also see that if we fix the heart and the diaphragm, so we start making these images where the spine is moving, right? Because obviously, you know, if they're moving relative to one another and you fix one, then the other one starts moving. So that, that's an issue as you, you see this uh, spine moving. But that's, you know, that's life. Uh, so side by side, this is what the non-motion corrected and the motion corrected. So that's the first step in doing perfusion analysis. And the rest is fairly simple. You just put an ROI on the myocardium, you measure this, the signal as a function of time, and you fit that to a model that gives you the, the amount of perfusion in it. So it's pretty simple. Some advanced stuff I wanted to show you is MR imaging during uh, lesion ablation. And so this is uh, left ventricle of a, of a pig, I think, or a dog, one of the two. And there's a, an RF ablation catheter here in the crux of the right ventricle. The ablation is turned on for 30 seconds, you know, and you can see immediately an increase in the T1 value around that burn. So you can, in real time, you can see the tissue change as you're burning it. This is not available when you're doing image guidance with ultrasound. It's not available when you're doing image guidance with fluoroscopy for this type of ablation procedure. In MR, we can see where that burn occurred, right? But remember, this edema on the outside here causing this increased signal might come back to normal, right? It doesn't mean the tissue's dead. It just means it's edematous. And so there, you, you need to know the sort of the penumbra of the edema expected when you do this kind of uh, burn. So here's another thing that, that we did with MR in the lab a little while ago, which was we took a injection catheter. Sorry about that. Uh, this is a, it's, it's called a, a stiletto injection catheter. So it goes up through a vessel, and then you can put it in tissue and inject, you know, chemotherapy. You can inject agents. We were injecting stem cells into the myocardium around an infarct. We thought stem cells might, you know, mesenchymal stem cells might reproduce myocardium uh, that had died after an infarct. It turns out we were very accurate at getting the stem cells where they had to go. We were very accurate at seeing where, if they were there, uh, however, they didn't seem to do much. What they did was they attracted a whole bunch of um, sort of inflammatory uh, markers and things like that to come and help uh, heal the tissue, but they didn't turn into myocardium, unfortunately. It's too bad. Uh, but anyway, we laid a very thin wire inside this catheter and turned it into an RF antenna inside the person's body, and we connected that RF antenna here to a receiver amplifier in the MR scanner. So the MR scanner just thought it was another coil, right? And <clears throat> then we made an image using the outside body coil. We made an image using this catheter coil, and we put the two together, right? And so there you can see, you know, in real time what's going on uh, with this catheter coil. There's a tiny little coil on its tip. So there's the first injection occurred here. And we're plugging into the myocardium, and then we make another injection here, and these cells are marked with a ferromagnetic agent so you can see them. So we're just going to plug away and inject all of these cells around the infarct in the myocardium under MR guidance. And so that, that, and that was done in, in real time, so I think, I think this movie probably works here. 
uh, that last movie I don't think worked. Yeah. So this is the, the operator is just looking at a screen and manipulating the catheter, right, and watching these MR uh, images come up in real time and then engaging. There they put a little dab of gadolinium in the tissue and then they're gonna, they know they have good contact and then they're going to inject the stem cells next, right? Uh, so it's, it's pretty cool and you can, in real time, manipulate the scan plane and, and look at, at different angles, etc. And then the other thing we did when we were on this kick of, of uh, turning magnetic resonance scanners into interventional devices is we did the first uh, MR-guided TAVR procedures. Uh, this is in animals, and we, and we have a trocar coming in here into the apex of the heart, and we're going to push a valve into the left ventricle under MR guidance and plug it into the root of the aorta here. And I think I have it. Oh, yeah, this movie probably works here. Right, so the surgeon slash interventionalist is watching the screen and manipulating this device here and pushing it towards uh, the aortic root so that they can plug it in. And I'll just speed it up here. See that? You pushed it into the aortic root there, blow it up with a balloon. You can watch that on MR, take the balloon down, suck everything back, and now you've got a new valve in the, in the heart. So this is done under fluoro nowadays in people. It's a, it's a, you know, it's called TAVR, uh, but this we did this under MR uh, guidance in order to take flow data and things like that during the procedure. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, those are the MR applications uh, that I thought could be interesting. There are, there's a book like maybe four inches thick on cardiac MR applications. It's just. It goes on and on and on. It's a, it's a tremendously versatile imaging uh, technique. And uh, people are still inventing ways to, to make better cardiac pictures. Um, 